I went to the doctor when the pain started, but why didn't they catch it? Why didn't they order more tests? If they had found it sooner, I wouldn't have to wonder if I would ever see my kids grow up. Will I ever be able to play with my kids again? I was happy. Life was good. 40-year-old guy like me, and the only way to go was up. Business consultant by day, playing guitar in a band by night, with a bona fide love story to my name since I'd married my high school sweetheart. We had four children, all two to nine years old, and my heart was full of love for all of them. Our roadmap in life was dotted and circled with things to do, places to be, the journey barely begun and far from over, with everyone in a cozy, happy little car together. I never saw it coming. Pain, first. Out of nowhere, right in the abdomen. It was just there, not doing much of anything, but not leaving either, always in the same place and steadily getting worse day by day. This pain was so unexpected. I was the picture of good health. This was just my body having a little hiccup. At that point, doubts were the furthest thing from my mind. Eventually, I had to admit that maybe it wasn't just simple pains. I went to the doctor, who put me through an ultrasound. When they pushed the wand over my abdomen, there was a sharp, sudden spike of mind-numbing pain, but the report turned up clean. Had I just been imagining things? Every part of me wanted to believe that, and I did for a handful of months. I reassured my wife, didn't bring it up with my kids, trying my best to calm myself by calming my family. But by October, the pain was hitting so hard that I'd have to lie down throughout the day. Over-the-counter pain medication refused to work anymore. I found it harder to play with my kids and skipped more and more sessions of band practice because I began to lose weight, energy, and appetite. My once active life fizzled out like a dying fire, and it took my morale down with it. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore, so my wife and I went to the emergency room hoping that they could do something, anything. I was put through a CT scan, and that's when they found it. The tumor on my pancreas. Okay, I thought, calm down, calm down. Just because it was a tumor, it didn't mean it was cancer. I think my wife was holding on to the same anchor of reasoning, and when we met the surgeon, our beliefs only grew stronger. It was operable, they said. This would be fine. It had to be fine. When I went into surgery, the surgeon found that the tumor was much larger than they thought, the size of a grapefruit. Thankfully, I didn't have time to be worried because I was out, and the surgeon did an excellent job of removing the entire thing in one go. I thought that the worst was over. It was a simple case of getting rid of the bad stuff, right? No tumor, no problem. But the doctors called me in to say I had stage three pancreatic cancer. They said, yeah, the surgery worked and bought me more time, but ultimately, it was going to be fatal. Chemo or radiation were options, but they didn't think it would do any good. It would probably just make my last moments more painful than they had to be and take away quality time with my family. I couldn't talk, couldn't even process their words, let alone trust myself to ask questions. As we moved rooms and met with a nurse who explained the treatment options if I still wanted them, I looked to my wife who'd been quiet this entire time. What I saw broke me more than the news had. She was crying, the tears falling openly. This was so unfair. I'd been healthy as a horse before this, no issues, no family history of cancer. We went home quietly. Pancreatic cancer had a dismal survival rate. The odds were so tremendously against me, supported by all the facts and figures out there. Why hadn't my doctors suspected my symptoms when the pain was just starting? Why hadn't they ordered more tests? Not only was it affecting me, but my wife as well. 
her pain. Her hurt could have been avoided if they'd caught it sooner. The cancer was so deadly because it was often detected so late. I was transferred to a cancer center, but that ended up being a bust. Since I wasn't feeling too great post-surgery, chances were tough if I could even withstand chemotherapy. It was either do the treatment and suffer or don't and enjoy what time I had left with my family. Things plummeted when another report showed the tumor had returned. My hopes and dreams started to disappear. My wife was always right there beside me, but even she was scared for the future. I felt like I'd run out of runway. Were these really my only options? I suddenly could not imagine the rest of my life. I thought of my kids, imagining them playing with their dad, watching him get weaker, not yet understanding why. I thought of my youngest child, who was only two at the time, and I knew that if I didn't fight this, he'd grow up never knowing who I was. My wife was with me and knew what I was thinking. She spurred me on and we talked about it, asked around, did some research. Our friends chipped in, urging us to get a second opinion and see if there were any other options. We ultimately met with one of the leading pancreatic cancer oncologists in the country who asked me to do a bunch more tests. I have a plan, said the oncologist, staring me straight in the eye. It's not going to be easy, and I can't promise you anything, but say the word, and I'll help you fight this. No beating around the bush, no honey coating, no false hope. I appreciated that. He spoke with confidence despite the harsh reality of the road ahead, and I knew that I would need to give my all. Nothing was going to stop me from staying with my family. My mind was made up. I was put on a new type of chemotherapy, specifically for those with pancreatic cancer. The first treatment went surprisingly well, and the surge of hope injected bursts of color into my life. I could do this, I thought. This was fine, great even. I rode this optimistic high all the way till the second treatment, and my entire world flipped upside down. Everyone told me that chemo ate away at you the more you did it, and I remembered those words as my hopes for a smooth recovery faded away. I couldn't play floor hockey with my kids anymore, couldn't help my wife around the house. I couldn't work. For the first time in my life, I barely had the strength to pick up my guitar, let alone play it. At times when I went for treatment, my blood work would betray me telling me that I wasn't healthy enough to even receive my chemo. My body was at war with itself and I was afraid I was losing. My health spiraled so quickly, I was thrown headfirst into doubt. Had I made the right choice? Should I have listened to the first doctor? Was I not meant to fight this after all? It took everything in me to muster up a smile and reassure my kids, patting their heads. I did this automatically, mechanically, and it wasn't until one day I saw my wife do the same that I realized I wasn't the only one hurting. Her fingers had been shaking. Even as she soothingly rubbed our two-year-old's back, her face composed and comforting, even though I could see the turmoil in her eyes. I realized she had done the same for me. I was seeing what this disease was doing to my family. If I didn't make it, what would happen to my family? What would become of all the hopes and dreams I have for them? There were so many important moments I would miss. It was around this time that the bonds between people truly shone. Friends and relatives burst forth from the woodwork, offering their time and energy to drive me to my treatments. They'd help make meals for my kids, take them to school and to play dates. Our neighbors supported my wife by doing our shopping and laundry. They all had busy lives too, but it's amazing to see how they made so much time and effort to help us. The community rallied around us and we couldn't have been more overwhelmed or more grateful. The day 
of my last chemo treatment came. After that, it was down to a waiting game. I got frequent scans to see if the chemo had been effective, if the cancer came back, and potentially worst of all, MRIs to see if it had spread to other parts of my body. This was mentally so exhausting. Every time we got the results, we would be back where we started. But throughout it all, my wife and I always talked about what was next. We talked about next week, next month, next year, plans, trips, events, how nice our kids' graduation would be. We didn't want cancer and potentially bad results to stop us from living. And if I had anything to say about it, it wouldn't. I knew that now. Gradually, these scans trickled out to just once per year. It was like time was being reversed. My weight, energy, and appetite came back. I could do things again, play with my kids, play music, help and hug and kiss my wife. Everything I earned back, everything I did, I did with vigor and the determination to love and value them more every day. The final touch, the final rush of hope and relief came when the doctor said, we don't need to see you anymore. For 14 years, I've been a pancreatic cancer survivor, and not once have I forgotten that. I've decided to share my story and help the Pank One Network fund research, raise awareness, and support the effort to increase survival rates. Today, the average survival rate is only 8% and is almost unchanged in 40 years because research is underfunded. If you are able and want to support the research, please click the link below. I'm reminded every day how lucky I am when I look in the mirror, feel the air in my lungs, hear my heartbeat. Getting a second opinion was my second chance at life and it put me on the rocky road to recovery, but it was still recovery all the same. The mental and physical weight of this disease was like a dark, overhanging cloud that never quite left until long after I was cleared. It was only by the strength of my wife, the thought of my kids, the generosity of friends, my faith in God, and the medical team's devotion that I made it out the other end in one piece.